the organization of human life, its systems of communication and systems of control are extended more and more and more in just the same way, for example, that by assimilating the minerals out of the soil and the rays out of the sunlight, a plant like a fern grows and grows and grows and extends its form. And in this way, its organization prevails. Now then, you see, if you take this task of what we call the conquest of nature, the task of making order victorious over chaos or randomness, if you take this seriously, you will look upon it as warfare. And you will firmly believe that the most urgent thing that there possibly can be is to make order prevail over randomness, to make good prevail over evil, to make life prevail over death. And we find that when we are in a contest of this kind, a serious warfare game of this kind, and we take it seriously, we are involved in it in a very deep and bitter sense. Now the difference of Buddhism from science as a form of knowledge is that in Buddhism it would be said that this view of things, this view of the task of life as making order triumph over disorder, leaves something out. You remember right at the beginning I made some importance of a Sanskrit word which is fundamental in Buddhism, avidya. Avidya. Which meant, a means non, vidya, knowing. Non-knowing or ignorance, or better, ignorance. Ignorance, in other words, leaving something out of account. And I want to use a familiar illustration to show in what way we ignore. You see here a figure which is apparently, as you look at it, two faces in profile about to kiss each other. Now, if we draw back a little from those two faces, we can see on the white area in between them the form of a cup. But the interesting thing about this is that as you look at it, you will either be able to see the form of the cup or the form of the two faces in profile, as it were, about to kiss each other. You can alternate them between them very rapidly, but you will not be able to see them both that way at the same time. In other words, either the white must be the background and the black the figure on the ground, or else the black must be the background and the white cup showing up on it. And so in this way, the, the point that I we make most of is that behind a vital religious life for the West, there has to be faith which is not expressed in things to which you cling, in ideas, opinions to which you cling in a kind of desperation. Faith is the act of letting go and that must begin with letting go of God, let God go. But you see, this is not atheism in the ordinary sense. Atheism in the ordinary sense is fervently hoping that there isn't a God. It has become extremely plausible that this trip between the maternity ward and the crematorium is what there is to life. And we still have going into our common sense the 19th century myth which succeeded the ceramic myth in Western history. I call it the myth of the fully automatic model.
of the universe. Namely, that it's stupid. It's blind force, uh, Haeckel's uh, gyration or fortuitous congress of atoms is of the same vintage as Freud's libido, the blind surge of lust at the basis of human psychology. But when you consider this attitude, you know, what is the poetic counterpart of it? Man is a little germ that lives on an unimportant rock ball that revolves about an insignificant star on the outer edges of one of the smaller galaxies. Oh, what a put down that was. But on the other hand, if you think about that for a few minutes, I am absolutely amazed to discover myself on this rock ball rotating around a, sp a spherical fire. It's a very odd situation. And the more I look at things, I, I cannot get rid of the feeling that existence is quite weird. I know that. See, a philosopher is a sort of intellectual yokel who, uh, 